So it's another year down. 2022 is in the books. As of this video's release, it's New Year's Eve in America. So Happy New Year. Uh, and wherever else you are in the world, Happy New Year there as well. Last year on New Year's, I did a video looking back at my first year of large format photography and took a look at my favorite images for the year and talked about some of the things I learned. And I thought maybe I'd do the same thing. Maybe I'll make it an annual occurrence. Uh, so just do a New Year's release looking back at the year. And this time I thought it'd be fun instead of me just rambling on. Maybe we talk about whatever you guys want to talk about. So the first part of this video is going to be a QA, and a uh, where I'm going to answer all the questions that uh, several of you guys sent in to me. And then the second part, we'll take a look at my picks for my top favorite images for the year 2022. I also had my Patreon supporters vote on which photo out of those was the top photo. So the number one photo for the year is voted by my Patreon supporters. That'll be coming up too after the Q&A. So I put a post up on my Instagram sometime last week asking for your questions, as well as a community post on the YouTube page. And I've compiled all those questions. I have them on my iPad here. They're in no certain order. I've just kind of grouped them together. Some of them are a little close together, kind of relevant. So I put those together. Uh, but otherwise, they're in no certain order. So we'll just go one by one, uh, starting right from the top. From Robert Lounder Photography, what is your day job? So I work for a company that specializes in molecular diagnostics, specifically in syndromic testing. And what that means in familiar terms, we make uh, PCR tests. Uh, we were doing it well before the start of the pandemic, uh, you know, a decade and a half or so. And we look for a lot more than just COVID and respiratory bugs. We have tests that look for bloodborne pathogens, things that would normally take a blood culture to diagnose, meningitis, uh, bone and joint infections, gastrointestinal bugs, STDs, uh, you name it. Uh, the PCR can actually be used for a lot of things and we make a ton of them. Uh, now I don't know anything about biology or the science that goes into the products that we make. I'm not that smart. The department I work for uh, is an automation engineering team. Uh, and what we do is we develop automated manufacturing equipment for the manufacturing floor. Uh, so I spend most of my time designing and building electrical control panels, working with PLCs and programming industrial robots. That's what I do. It's a pretty technical job. Uh, but it's nowhere near as crazy as some of the scientists and the biologists that work for a company. I don't know. It's insane, the stuff they come up with. So the next question was related. This is from Matt Wettis. What's up, Matt? <laughs> Matt's got a YouTube channel. It's pretty fun to watch, too. You should check it out. I'll put a link in the description. But he asked, are you also a photographer in your day job? Uh, so no, obviously. Uh, but one of the things that we do a lot of is machine vision. Uh, so teaching a robot, you know, to move to a specific spot based off camera feedback. Or in past jobs, we had some applications where we did high-speed imaging of the parts, you know, running down a conveyor system or something. Uh, and actually, that's where I got a lot of my understanding of aperture and shutter speed and strobe lighting is from machine vision. So a lot of the fundamentals of, uh, you know, the reciprocity triangle, uh, my first introduction to that actually came from my job. So you can imagine that depending on what the application is, you know, and how complex of an inspection you're trying to do, uh, some of this machine vision stuff can get pretty crazy. That was my first introduction to what a telecentric lens does, as opposed to, you know, your normal camera lens. You may be familiar with infrared imaging, but what about SWIR, S-W-I-R, shortwave infrared? That's some, you want to go down a rabbit hole, some really interesting stuff, check that out. So no, unfortunately, as much as I'd like to make photography my day job, uh, I'm sure like a lot of people, uh, yeah, I got to pay the bill some other way for, for the time being. From Nikki Aztec, do you have any book recommendations for new film photographers? Uh, the Ansel Adams a Photo Guide series, I think, or something like that. Uh, specifically, uh, The Camera and The Negative, those two books. I would check those out. There's a lot of, a lot of good stuff in there. A lot, of good, a lot of good content, especially if you're new. This one's from Matthew Mishevsky. Sorry if I mispronounced these, by the way. I'm terrible at <laughs> pronouncing. Uh, they asked, uh, do you have a favorite photo book, new or old? Uh, Adam Gibbs is Quiet Light, probably. It's just a beautiful collection of photographs. Absolutely incredible, the body of work that guy has. I mean, he's been, you know, been a photographer forever. But that's a truly, truly inspirational collection of work. If you don't have that one, you definitely should pick it up. 
I've uh, only recently started kind of collecting a lot more photo books. Uh, I probably only have about a half a dozen of them. Uh, but of the ones I have, that's probably my favorite. Uh, also worth mentioning is Waiting for the Light, David Naughton, or Noten. Uh, and I'll put these in the description too, in case you can't make sense of what it is I'm trying to say. Uh, and then, of course, Ben Horns, Between the Wind. It's hard not to uh, acknowledge that book. Early on in my journey as a photographer, uh, Ben was extremely influential to my work, as you might be able to tell. Uh, so it's really hard not to mention that. It's a really beautiful collection of work. Negative Amnesiac asks, do you have any photography goals for 2023? And did you uh, have any goals for 2022? That's a great question. Uh, last year, uh, one of my top goals was to make sure I got out for the fall season more. Uh, I mentioned that in one of my videos too. It, it's just that doing one big trip towards the end of October in Zion uh, was just, I mean, that's, of course, it's hard not to do that, but there's so much more of the fall season. So I went to Colorado this year, which was really, I'll probably be going back again next year. Um, that was a absolutely beautiful place. Uh, and then there was a couple trips that I took just locally around Utah. Uh, just checking out the fall color and looking for photographs, exploring some new areas. Uh, I didn't do any videos on those because it, it didn't end up turning into anything. But just being out and about and trying to take advantage of the season a little more was my goal. I think it made good on that. Uh, and then for 2023, uh, I think this might be the year that I get back to printing again. That's been on my mind for a long time now. And I think I'm ready to start giving that a shot again. We'll see how it goes. There's a lot of work to do to creating the print collection. So I don't know if I'll have anything to show for it in 2023. We'll see. But I definitely want to move towards that direction for sure. Semi-related question here from the Depressed Shutter. What are your long-term goals, if any, with shooting large formats? That's hard to say. Uh, I need to put more thought into that question, actually. So you would think that's something that I would have <laughs> figured out, but uh, I, don't, I don't know that there is really an end goal with it. That's for sure. I suppose a lot of it's the same as a lot of folks, you know, you know, that want to get my uh, print collection up, um, start working on more, you know, print collections, plural. It'd be nice to, you know, to have a gallery someday, you know, maybe want to mold and, you know, too worn out to be able to go out in the field as much, you know, just kind of the same things that a lot of people have you know, on, in their, on their mind, you know, as a long-term goal, specifically with large formats, uh, I think I just want to continue to try to learn as much as I can about it. Get as good at metering and exposure as I can possibly get. Uh, and just continue to build a body of work for right now. That's kind of the biggest the biggest thing. Just continue to get more and more images and more work under my belt. And then, it, of course, create collections out of that. But that's one that definitely gets me thinking more. So thanks for that question. That's something I, gotta, <laughs> I need to answer for myself. Next one's from Tiffany. Do you do other types of photography or do you just stick to nature? Uh, mostly nature, landscapes. That's really where my interests are. That's, a, that's where my passion is. Uh, there are other things, if I had infinite time, that I would like to explore. At some point, I think I'd like to lean into macro photography more. Uh, and I'd also like to try cityscapes, street photography. Less uh, sticking cameras in people's faces when they're inspecting it, not that kind of street photography. Uh, but like... Alexei uh, Titorenko, I think is his name. If you Google City of Shadows photography, uh, it's a collection of work where it's, a, it's all black and white kind of stuff where I think he's, it's just super fascinating stuff where he's got longer exposures. The show is kind of ghosting of people and figures. So you can make out that there was people there and it shows the motion of the people, but less individual and more collective side and motion of people in cities. Uh, I think it's absolutely fantastic. Check that stuff out. I'll put a link uh, in the description for that too. It's just incredible work. Next questions from Andrew Finley. Where do babies come from? Duh. The storks bring them. <laughs> uh, like I said earlier, I don't know anything about biology. <laughs> Andrew's got another photography channel on YouTube too. I'll link to his channel down below. Next one's from Taryn and Doria. Sorry if I mispronounced that. As a movie buff, I wanted to ask you, do you watch movies? And having an eye of a photographer, do you have some favorites with great cinematography? That's a, that's a 
interesting question and something I hadn't thought about before. Uh, I'll be honest, I don't know much about cinematography. I don't know if I could really pick out, you know, the difference between good and bad cinematography in words that, you know, cinematographers would use. Uh, I can just tell you what I like and what I don't like. Uh, I do like movies. I don't watch as many of them as I would like to. Uh, it's just a matter of time, having time. Some classics I can think of that come to mind that I really still enjoy, you know, that I, you know, I think have good cinematography in them. Uh, it'd be like the original Alien movie. I like, absolutely love that movie. I adore how it still feels futuristic, even today, even though it was released in like the late 70s, like 78 or 79, I think, something like that. I suppose another one would probably be The Prestige, with Hugh Jackman, Christian Bale. I just think the story is absolutely fantastic, and the way they delivered it is great. I'm the type of movie watcher who has no problem suspending disbelief, uh, so I can I can take a lot, <laughs> you know, especially since sci-fi, you know, is probably my favorite genre. That's one that I think is is a really fascinating movie, and I think it's really well done. Uh, and then maybe and the other note I had here was The Revenant. Uh, I really, really loved that movie. That was a really moving storyline, I thought. Uh, it was just incredible, all the things that Leo's character went through in that, in that film. It was just nuts. Uh, but I think the way it was delivered and the way each shot was designed, you know, the setting, cinematography, the color work in it, I, th I, thought, it was, I thought it was great. So I don't know if those fit the category of good cinematography or not, uh, but those are some of the ones that come to mind when I think about some of my favorites, things that are stand out. For, for better or worse, I guess. Next one's from Matthew again, also kind of related. Uh, what's your favorite movie you've seen this year? That would probably be Top Gun Maverick. For no other reason than that's pretty much the only movie I saw this year. <laughs> for new releases anyway. Uh, I'm really behind on, on new movies. That's, some, that's just the way I've always been. It has to be something that's really stand out for me to make the effort to go to the theater to see a new release anyway. And then by the time it comes out and it's available, to watch at home, it's, it's just like I could watch it any time. So what's the what's the rush? And then I just get behind on them. I'll have to improve that. I'll have to just binge watch a bunch of movies, get caught up. Why don't you let me know what your favorite one this year was? I'll watch that. <laughs> this one's from Fred Holmstock. Film selection, i.e. color palette and dynamic range for various compositions and the metering thereof. This one's a rabbit hole. This can go on for a long time. Uh, and this is something I'm still figuring out. That's why in you know several of my videos, you'll see me dual shoot Velvia and Provia both because uh, I'm still kind of feeling this out and deciding how that works for me. Uh, but, but generally, uh, what's happened over time is I've started to think about this backwards. I start to pick compositions that fit the film stock that I'm trying to shoot. So you start to look for different things uh, based on whatever film stock that you prefer to shoot with. Velvia's dynamic range is, you know, Famously, only about four or five stops. It probably looks best at about four. You start to push the highlights too much, and it just it doesn't hold detail. And the blacks will crush on you if you're not too careful. So if you're carrying a lot of Velvia in your backpack, uh, you tend to kind of look for things that are flatter, you know, or at least, you know, more even light. That being said, Velvia is kind of like adding special effects to me. So it's like if you could buy a filter that you could screw on the front of your lens that would make every photo you take with it shout at the viewer. That's, that's how I look at Velvia. If you want the photograph to kind of use its inside voice to keep with the metaphor, uh, Velvia is not the, not the choice. There are exceptions to that. I've seen Velvia be pretty subtle and, and beautiful at times too, uh, so it can happen. Uh, but generally, it tends to be a little over the top. And that's kind of the quality that a lot of people like about it. For something that's a little more subtle, you know, earth tones, maybe a little quieter scene that you don't need to be quite so loud with color with, uh, that's where Provia and E100 comes in for me. Uh, for scenes that have higher dynamic range, uh, in excess of four or five stops, that's where the color negatives come in, uh, like Ektar 100, Portra 160. Ektar 100, in my experience anyway, seems to be a little more saturated than 160, so if it's something I still want to keep a lot of color saturation with, uh, but keep a lot of detail in the highlights. Uh, that's that's Ektar. The portrait films have got a reputation for being more pastelish kind of t color palette, but that's really only if you push it. It seems like if you expose it 
you know, it normally instead of pushing the film or like overexposing it, um, actually works really well for landscapes too. It's kind of the same thing as Velvia versus Probia on color negative for me. So if I want something that's very, very colorful, you know, but retains a ton of detail, that's Ektar. That's stuff that's a little more soft, painterly like. Um, I'll tend to try to shoot 160 if I have it on me. And then black and white, uh, of course, is all about tonal contrast. So, of course, since you don't have color data to work with, uh, I mean, it responds differently to color wavelengths, but, of course, the output is, is there's no color in it. So I tend to look for compositions that make use of a lot of tonal contrast. Uh, it might seem obvious, but it's not really that easy to do sometimes. Uh, you got to learn to look at a scene differently. You know, you have to look for different things. Train your eyes to not see the color so much as, as the values um, in a scene. Sometimes what you'll see uh, as photographers, myself included, uh, will take a color photo that didn't turn out quite so hot uh, and they'll convert it to black and white. They'll do a black and white conversion because somehow stripping all the color information and cranking up the contrast, you know, seems to work better. Unfortunately, as I'm learning, uh, converting a color photo because it sucks in color usually just results in a sucky photo with no color. <laughs> <laughs> Black and white has its own needs and its own strengths and its own weaknesses. And you have to treat it entirely different. It is just another tool in a toolbox, but the use of that tool is totally different than color. I won't try to pretend like I have enough experience to really give you a definitive guide on how to you know, compose for black and white because I'm still learning that. Uh, but I suspect that with, with time and experience, I'll learn or at least get hopefully better with it. I can tell you that out of the limited collection of black and white photographs I've taken, there are very few that I'm actually happy with. And that is because most of the time, uh, what I was visualizing probably would have worked better in color than it did in black and white. So I feel like I got a long ways to go before I can give any real advice on that. Uh, now, as far as metering on all of these, my metering system, uh, I've talked about before. I just use Nick Carver's method. Uh, I think it works for my brain anyway. But basically, it's just relative stops to middle tone. Uh, so you pick a middle tone in your scene, and then everything else is placed relative to that. So you know, a plus one would be a stop above whatever you've metered for middle tone. You know, minus two would be two stops below that. Uh, so typically with Velvia, and actually even with Provia, uh, I tend to only go a maximum range of about two stops, plus or minus. So I figure out whatever my middle tone needs to be. Sometimes that changes, it depends on the scene. If the scene's flat enough, you can get, kind of decide where the middle tone lies. Uh, but whatever I've decided is gonna be the middle tone for that scene, I don't tend to go more than about two stops, plus or minus. Because to me, it just doesn't it doesn't hold detail well enough, and I don't like the look of it. Uh, Velvia is less forgiving, of course, because the dynamic range is really, really narrow. But I don't think that Provia looks good when you expose too hot either. So I tend to treat that similar to Velvia, although I tend to see more detail in the shadows and stuff with Provia. So it's a little more forgiving than Velvia is, but I meter them pretty similarly. And then, of course, with E6 color reversal films you want to protect your highlights uh, so I'm metering to make sure that I don't blow out detail in the highlights because those areas will go clear on the film and you will never be able to recover the detail if you underexpose your shadows uh, that's not necessarily ideal either but at least there you can recover some detail by you know adjusting your scan settings to, you know scan for longer and increase the exposure so you can get more light through there but on the highlights they're gone they're gone forever you can't recover that Color negative and black and white negative both um, are the opposite of that, of course. So you want to meter for your shadows and don't lose too much detail there because those areas will go thin on the negative and you won't be able to recover detail. Uh, but the negative films have a vastly more forgiving dynamic range, of course. Unless it's just absolutely unreasonable dynamic range. Like if you're shooting in a slot canyon in this really dark corner and then you have uh, like direct sun and coming in or something like that. Um, Unless it's some situation like that, I don't really tend to worry about the highlights so much. At least with Ektar and Portra, which are the only two color negatives I've really shot with. Uh, and then black and white negative seems to be similar, depending on the film stock. Uh, 
you can really let it rip in the highlights. And it's surprising how much detail it'll hold. It won't always look the best. So if you have, you know, seven, eight stops, brighter highlights, you know, they may not look natural, um, but it oftentimes will, will hold that detail. So with the negative films, I'm trying to make sure I have enough detail in my shadows. Now that doesn't mean take your shadows and expose them to the moon. Uh, you want all your tones to be in the right spot. If it's something that's supposed to be dark, make it dark. You know, just make sure that the tonal representations on the film are appropriate for whatever it is in the scene. Uh, and then with color negative, I just don't really worry about what the highlights are doing unless it's just absolutely ridiculous, you know. I took Ektar and shot directly at the sun filtering through the trees in the redwoods. And it was surprising how much detail it held. Of course, those areas, you know, where the sun star is are going to be blown out white, but that's that's how it looks, you know. So in that case, I was looking to make sure that the darkest shadow areas on like the tree trunks, on the redwood tree trunks and stuff, uh, still had texture and detail on them. And then I just placed them on the scale of tonal values, you know, whether you use a zone system or stops relative to middle tone. I just put them appropriate to where they would still have texture and detail. So like zone three, zone four. Uh, and then I didn't worry about what the sun did because it's going to turn white no matter what. That's about the best I can do for advice on metering. Because uh, I'm still pretty new with it. I'm learning and making tons of mistakes still. But that's something I'm hoping I can improve on and get get it to a point where I can teach it a little better. But that's, I'm not there yet. A related question from Matthew again. Do you have a favorite film stock? It's probably Provia 100F. The reciprocity on it is good up to two minutes. So you don't have to do reciprocity failure adjustments up until two minutes. The shadows go a bit cyan on it. Whereas Velvia goes like blue, straight blue or almost purple sometimes. Uh, I'd say I probably have a love-hate relationship with Velvia, uh, to be honest. It can look absolutely beautiful, but it can look atrocious too. <laughs> and to me, it seems like uh, Provia, I get more consistent results with it. It's really good to work with. E100 is pretty good. It's like, a, it's pretty similar to Provia, but I think I like Provia a little better. Uh, I did a film comparison video you might have seen uh, where I compared Velvia, Provia, and E100 from Kodak together side by side. And what I got out of that personally was that uh, Pro I think Provia is my favorite. It still is. That being said, if I could have all my Christmases and birthdays all at once and have anything I ever wanted, I think it'd be interesting to see Velvia get re-released, reformulated, so that it has a similar re reciprocity characteristics to Provia. That'd be really cool. If you could have all that color saturation, boosted reds and a little bit of magentas and stuff in a film stock that doesn't absolutely fall on its face on reciprocity, that would be great. I'd love that. I'd, I'd think that'd be great. Probably wishful thinking. And I know Velvia 100 was out for a little while. I never got to shoot that because they made it illegal to, to buy it. So no, I can't comment on that. But Provia it is for now. This one's from Steven. D. Killian Photography. Best resources for large format lenses. Interestingly enough, uh, Nick Carver just did a video on 6x17, or lenses he uses with the 6x17 camera. And he mentioned a spreadsheet in there from Michael K. Davis. Uh, you can find it at largeformatphotography.info. I ran across this spreadsheet, you know, a couple years ago when I was researching lenses uh, to buy for my large format kit. Uh, and I agree with Nick Carver. It's it's an absolutely fantastic resource. Resource. In fact, if you just check out that entire website, so go to largeformatphotography.info. I'll put that link down in the description. Uh, there's all kinds of good stuff on there. The website looks like it's from straight from the 90s, but it's a fantastic website. It's it's really good. That's if you're looking for information on specifications, you know, image circle stuff like that. Um, just all the data. On, on about all these lenses that's a good resource now if by resources you mean where to buy them uh i just get all mine from japan on ebay seems like most of the sellers selling lenses for large format are from japan there's a couple tips i can give you though the one thing is you got to learn their rating system i don't get why but everything seems to be mint <laughs> it's like excellent mint five stars and then the bottom level is like good. So if it says it's good condition, watch out. Look, it's a photo is real good. The good thing is most of these listings from these sellers, um, 
are pretty consistently the same, or they have similar. You'll see a really similar thread if you look at enough listings from Japan. They all have this ridiculous rating system, uh, but then they'll list, you know, like optical, whether there's any defects, you know, with the with scratches or dust or coating defects or something like that. That's what I look at. I look at what they've claimed in their description for any sort of defects, and then I take a really, really good look at the photos and make sure that I don't see anything that looks, you know, like an opt like a defect on the lens or something. Of course, since it's used, you're always taking a gamble. You know, it's always at the discretion of the seller, you know, how they've rated it and whether or not it actually represents that. But um, you always have the eBay buyer protection. So if you really have a dispute, you could you try to get your money back. Um, so that's that's where I go. I just go to eBay. Seems to be where a lot of people go. Another one from Matthew. Uh, what's your favorite large format lens? Probably my Nikkor SW 90 millimeter at 4.5. It's an absolute beast of a lens. It's beautiful. It takes excellent images. Optics are great on it. And it's 4.5 aperture on the ground glass is super bright. I, I love that lens. However, it's probably not my most used one. My most used one is probably my Fujinon 180 millimeter. That was the first lens I ever bought. And I don't know that it's the best 180 millimeter lens out there. There may be other variants from other series that are better, sharper, or something like that. But I sure, I sure like it. So yeah, the 90 millimeter is probably my favorite. Although the 180 I use more. From Robert Lauder Photography, have you considered shooting more medium format? Yes. Yes, I have. Uh, truth be told, when I first started getting into film, I actually wanted to buy a Mamiya RZ67 kit is what I was after. I thought that was a really nice compromise between a really big negative roll film convenience and it was a systems camera or system camera. Uh, the problem is price. You know, there's been a gold rush on, on used cameras, especially in medium formats. So at the time, that kit would have cost me so much to buy that it didn't make sense economically to do that. And I could get into large format for cheaper. So that's actually why I bought my Toyo 4x5 to begin with. Because the cost of entry into large format was less than buying a highly sought after medium format system. Specifically in 6.7. And it, it didn't matter if you went to Pentax 6.7. Mark II or whatever, or if you went Mamiya 6.7. I could do an RB instead of an RZ kit for a lot cheaper. Um, but then you have all the drawbacks to come with that. Older lenses, older film backs, you know, and all this stuff starting to get older and aging and starting to break down and have issues, you know. So my thinking was going with an RZ kit left me able to use all the lenses, you know, the newer film backs, all, all the things. It was just cost prohibitive. Little did I know at the time that large format was not cheap either. <laughs> Man, what a rabbit hole. It, it, just, it just never ends. There's always something to spend a ton of money on. Uh, so it was, it was cost prohibitive either way. So what it really ended up coming down to, I guess, was that large format was always kind of the goal. That's where I wanted to go. Medium format was supposed to just be a good stepping stone to help me learn more about shooting film and less about, you know, and not have to spend less energy working and worrying about the camera and learning all the, you know, intricacies of running a view camera, let alone all the hassle of dealing with film sheets as opposed to roll film. And I suspect that's, you know, the same for a lot of people. That's probably why the medium format cameras are so in, so in demand. Uh, it's just that manufacturers aren't making them anymore. So the demand only continues to go up as film gets more and more popular, sees more and more resurgence. Now, of course, just recently, Pentax released a development announcement uh, saying that they're working on a new film camera. They didn't give any details, but that's interesting. But then a lot of people will see a new medium format camera. That would be awesome. I don't have any expectations. I would be surprised if they start with a 35 millimeter and see where it goes from there. But man, it'd sure be cool to see him release a new 6.7 or something, I would probably be all over that and would buy that. Now, for the most part, uh, for really critical work, I've done some soul searching with this one, trying to decide in what case would I go on to some photo trip and want to shoot a smaller negative. 
than 4x5. And of course I wouldn't. I would rather just shoot everything on large format and have a nice big huge 4x5 film negative or positive. But logistics started to get in the way. Specifically when you travel. A lot of the challenges with trying to travel with large format isn't just the camera and lenses itself. It's all the support equipment you need. You know, film changing tent, film holders, you know, boxes of film. Trying to go through airport security with roll film is pretty straightforward. But handing, you know, a box to an airport security agent and saying, you can't open this, but you can't put it through the scanner. <laughs> it's not so bad if maybe you're traveling with sealed boxes, but what about your exposed film and you're coming back? Well, they want to know what's in the box, you know, but they can't open the box and they can't put it through the scanner because, yeah, I know that some people do travel with large format sheet film. Uh, I, that is not an obstacle that I have taken on just yet. So medium format to me is a really good compromise for being able to travel with roll film and make the logistics of that easier. And so far, I've accomplished that by just adapting a roll film back to my large format camera using Horseman film backs. And of course, I do still have my Bronica 6x6 medium format camera, so I don't have a lot of excuses for not shooting medium format more. Uh, it's just that, for the most part, especially when it's somewhere I can drive to uh, and carry all the equipment that I need to, uh, large format is just kind of my main focus. But I do anticipate that I will shoot more, large, more medium format as time moves on. This one's from Echo Lens Photography. What has been your biggest personal takeaway from shooting large format? Everything's a compromise. That's what I put in my notes to talk about. Uh, even with big film, lots of movements, etc. you know, you have to choose what is most important about your composition. And everything's a compromise from there. Just like getting a new digital camera with all the latest and greatest bells and whistles and big, huge sensor on it with massive resolution. Just because resolving power, the potential resolving power is greater, uh, doesn't mean that there aren't trade-offs. Uh, and it's the same with large format. You have a bigger film negative. You have more potential for capturing detail. But it does not automatically mean that you get more detail. You have to fight for it. You have to make compromises to make that happen. Once you learn to accept that and start to lean into that and use it to your advantage, that's, that's, the, that's where I'm at right now. It's trying to use all this stuff to your advantage to produce you know, photos that you're happy with, the results that you're happy with. Uh, but then don't worry about the things that you couldn't get in. Focus is a good example. You know, large format camera has all these movements to build a shifter plane of focus like a tilt shift lens. Or I guess a tilt shift lens is trying to be a large format camera, I guess, more, more appropriately. But you have all these tools and ability to shift your camera around and make all these movements to try to get fantastic sharpness. But, you know, you, you often run into things to where no matter how you twist and contort the camera, you can't quite get everything perfectly, you know, sharp. So you have to make compromises. But you can use that as a tool to try to guide the viewer's eye into wherever you want it to focus, you know, want them to focus on. Similarly, if you try to use too many movements, you'll get distortion, you know. So like rear movements, you can, you can exaggerate features. It can technically be considered an optical defect. Uh, just by nature of shifting the camera around, but then you can use that to your advantage, you know, and say, hey, well, I want a more pronounced foreground here, you know, or I want to match the background to be as, fill the frame as predominantly as the, as the foreground, and you can shift the camera and use those compromises to your advantage, depending on whatever it is that you're trying to achieve with the photo. I would say that that's kind of where I'm at in my, and that's my biggest personal takeaway right now, is trying to understand and no matter how big a camera you use or how expensive of lenses you buy or what, whatever, there's always compromises that have to be made. It's just physics. And the, the better you learn to use that to your advantage, the better off you'll be and probably happier with your photos. From Celestrin Swanson, what is your most important piece of non-photography gear you take on your long trips? Arguably, that's probably my Garmin in reach. Safety wasn't always a concern of mine. Uh, and to be honest, uh, it's not my first thought, even still. <laughs> so that's not a very 
fun answer, uh, but that's that's probably the most important one. Uh, I'd hate to be in a situation where I have to be like that guy from Utah in that movie 127 Hours or whatever. He got caught in a climbing accident and had to cut his own arm off in order to survive. Yeah, that's what the garment's for. <laughs> but since that's not so fun, um, my second answer is probably my iPad. There was a trip. I went to Capitol Reef National Park a couple years ago over Thanksgiving. That time of year in Capitol Reef, uh, it's frigid. The temps are cold, very cold. I mean, the lows were 17, 18 degrees at night, and I was tent camping in the park. And the daylight hours weren't very long. So by 6 o'clock, for sure, it'd be pitch black and getting really cold. So I'd go spend my evenings and the night in my tent uh, just trying to stay warm. And one of the worst things about that trip was trying to fight boredom because I could only stay in my tent for so long, you know. You crawl in your sleeping bag to stay warm, and I'd sit there and watch, you know, movies on my on my phone, on my cell phone, but I only had so much, and there's no cell service in the park. So what I would do is I'd drive in to town to get some cell service and download a bunch of YouTube videos or something like that, and then just go crawl in my tent, and I'd try to stay warm and watch YouTube. It's one of the worst times I can remember trying to fight boredom, and it was difficult to try to continue to stay out in the landscape and complete the trip as opposed to just packing up and coming home because I was bored. So ever since then, I bring the laptop with movies on it. And if it gets really bad, I can always just crawl in, into the tent and just watch movies and stay entertained. So at least then I'm not fighting boredom. From Shaka, 1277. How often do you visit a location with no specific shot in mind? Just a place. Uh, I would say often. Nearly always, maybe. Uh, it's hard not to have expectations when you're going to a place, uh, especially if you're traveling a long distance, you know, if you travel across the country or something to go to a place, I mean, you have expectations, of course, you know, but too much of that uh, can lead into dis disappointment. Now, usually this happens uh, to photographers when you're shooting the icons and you're going somewhere iconic as an, you know, well-known locations, honeypot locations or whatever you want to call them that have iconic views. And I do shoot the icons too. Of course I do. Uh, they're icons for a reason. But my expectations for what I'm going to capture there are totally different. You know, they look at my shot versus all the other shots, potentially thousands and thousands of photographers that have stood there taking that same image. It's just a numbers game at that point. Somebody is going to have been at that location with better conditions than what you have. That's, that's just a fact. It's just by the numbers, by odds. So you can't get too hard on yourself when you try to start comparing your image from tunnel view in Yosemite to all the other photographers out there. It's just not fair. It's, it's hard to shoot something like that and be there at the right time to get something that's truly special and unique. Uh, and there's a couple examples of this I can think of in my own photography. Um, Badwater Basin, Death Valley is, is one for me. It's kind of like my kryptonite. <laughs> that and the sand dunes, oh man. I know other photographers who live in Las Vegas, you know, and in an hour, hour and a half, they can be at Badwater Basin. So when there's really good conditions, you know, they can just run out there and shoot that. And whether they get something that's good or not, so what? It's not that big of an investment. Uh, and then they can do that repeatedly. So those are typically the times where I will go to a location with a specific shot in mind is because it's something that I'm waiting for specific conditions for. I'm going to go out there and try to get that because I know right where it is and I've been waiting for these conditions. And for the guys who live right there near the park, you know, Badwater or the sand dunes or something like that is it's, it's easy for them to be able to bounce out there and do that. Uh, but for me, when it's, you know, nine hours away, it's just, just can't do that. So my expectations of what I'm going to get in an iconic location like Badwater have to be different. So in that regard, uh, I much prefer to just get to a general location and just scout and explore and just be curious and just try to find things that interest me. Uh, I'd much prefer that pace. Of course, if you go to somewhere like the Redwoods, for example, you're really expecting to shoot big trees, of course. Uh, but it doesn't necessarily mean that I'm going to go shoot a specific tree. You know, I'm going to go to a, a, a grove, I'm going to hike around, and I'm going to look around and be curious and try to find things that interest me based off of the conditions that I'm given. You know, that's kind of key. And in that way, you 
you can tend to find, or you have a better chance of finding unique photos than no one else has. Um, and it also makes me feel a little more satisfied with my work, I guess, when I look back on it, uh, because I found things, you know, I'd like to just go explore and find a photograph as opposed to um, go in there for anything specific, because then I can look back at the body of work that I did in that location uh, and be happy with my findings, you know, the things that I was able to uncover while I was there. So from trip to trip, I may go to the same location. You know, I go as I've been designed every year for the last handful of years. And I may go back there with something specific that I found the year before. So there may be a specific photo that I have in mind there. But for the most part, I get there and I just start exploring and try to come up with a game plan of what I want to photograph based off of whatever it is that I find while I, while I scout. For me, that seems to work much better and much more so happy with my work that way. This one's from Jay Gerritsen, Fine Art Photo. Do you process your own black and white film? And what are your thoughts on it? Honestly, I think it's a real pain in the rear. <laughs> you may have seen, I've done a couple of videos on black and white uh, film comparison. And that's kind of one of those things that turned into a bigger rabbit hole than I ever thought it might. Black and white in general, I think can go one of two ways. You can go the simple route where you just ship it off to a lab. Or you can go the very, very difficult, long way of the processing it yourself. And it's far more nuanced than I ever, ever thought it was. The first exposures I ever took on 4x5 were actually black and white negative film. And that was because it was cheaper, felt simpler, uh, and it was more forgiving, I thought. Uh, easier to meter for because it's you know black and white negative film as opposed to like an E6 you know color reversal film. But then as I tried developing my own film, uh, that, that completely flipped the script. So it's kind of like dealing with nothing but variables. There, there, there are very few, if any, constants. You know, everything from developer time to developer you use, the actual film stock itself, nothing, there's no constants anywhere. It's all variables. So it's really just whatever combination of inputs you give it, you know, and it can create drastically different results. And me, I find that incredibly difficult to try to get your head around it requires tons of experimentation uh it, it can be everything subjective and that's kind of where i'm at with my process is learning through experimentation right now uh, i don't currently trust my own process enough to be able to do any critical work so if it's something you know i went somewhere in Zion or something like that and shot a bunch of black and white negative film. Uh, I don't currently trust myself and my process enough to be able to process that at home myself. I send it to a lab. Uh, but I do experiment with some roles at home myself. Uh, and I will do more of that. What do I think of it? Honestly, if you're really serious about black and white negative, that's probably the way to go, though. Although being infinitely customizable like that makes things difficult uh, it does mean that you can dial things in perfectly to your taste so that's the direction that i have been drifting towards although that is not currently my process just because i haven't done enough of that experimentation to know what type of developer what development time you know what agitation method all these things that just going to require a lot of experimentation it's just something i'm still working out one more question from jay garrettson what role does diffraction have in large format? Uh, I suspect it's much the same as any other format. Uh, anytime you Im image through an extremely small hole relative to the recording medium, uh, this can be an issue. This is something that I've been planning to dig into and explore in more detail, perhaps in another video in the future. I'll have to find some optical targets to shoot. Those are kind <laughs> of expensive, uh, but some controlled studio lighting. And then trying to take, you know, a, a range of exposures all at different apertures, but equivalent exposures or something. Maybe I'll learn something, but uh, I'm generally not that worried about it, to be honest. If the concept new to you, diffraction is a result of light bending uh, around the edge of an obstruction in its way. In this case being the aperture blades. Uh, and that leads to an overall decrease in sharpness. You can actually see a similar effect. I don't know if it's exactly the same, uh, but if you have like a bright light source, like a window or something that's several feet away, you want it like 20, 30 feet away. You don't want it too close to you. You want a sharp edge of some sort. Hold your index finger out 
focus on your finger and just move it towards that sharp contrasting edge. Go ahead and try this. No one's no one's looking at you. And if they are, so what? If you get it just right, you can actually see it'll look like that edge is warping, like the light bends around your finger almost. This is just physics. Uh, it's something that you have to be aware of, but but I do think this is something that some worry about a little too much. Now, some photographers will absolutely die on this hill. <laughs> I have had comments uh, that with calculations that proves to me mathematically why I'm wrong and that all my photos are blurry and I should be shunned and my camera's taken away and no female should ever be allowed to mate with me ever again. But fun fact, this happens all the time at any aperture. It's just that at the wider, at the bigger apertures, there's more volume of light that's coming through the lens in straight paths versus uh, light that's being bent by the aperture blades. So it isn't as prevalent, you can't see it as much. But what does this mean for photography? Uh, well, like I mentioned before, there's always compromises that have to be made. Uh, there's trade-offs for everything. It's probably not ideal to run around taking all your photos at your smallest aperture on your lens all the time. But they are there for a reason and you shouldn't be afraid to use them if all the combination of the elements in your scene that you're photographing dictate that that be the case. Smaller apertures are attributed to larger depth of field, so more is in focus. Uh, but specifically with large formats and view cameras, um, you should rely on your movements to help minimize the challenges you face in trying to focus for a given scene. That is the purpose of having all of those movements is to be able to shift the camera around or adjust the camera in order to minimize those, those issues and then get the rest with a small aperture and depth of field as needed. Absolute sharpness, this might get me skinned in the comments, but absolute sharpness is only one thing on a list of inputs that go into creating an image. Arguably, it's not even always the most important factor. Personally, I choose to worry more about whether or not I'm happy with a given result, given all of the decisions I had to make on the fly and all the challenges I had to face in the moment. And I worry less about the diffraction boogeyman. But that's my take. Baka tip or Baka type. Sorry, I don't know how to pronounce that. Do you ever print or think about printing? And what process would you or do you use? I did do some limited printing uh, in the past, mostly inkjet on just photo luster paper. Uh, and I do have some of my images on my walls in my house. They're not what I would consider to be fine art prints. Uh, they're just cheap frames and stuff, but it's just my house, you know, made me happy at the time. As mentioned earlier, that's one of my goals coming up in the, in the next year or two, uh, is to get back into printing. Uh, I'm going to have to get a new printer uh, because the printer that I had is completely plugged up. Uh, so a lot of the nozzles are plugged up and I get banding, get white bands in my prints. Printing hardware is just kind of one of those things. Uh, that printer is old enough and the replacement parts to fix that probably just as much as buying a new printer. So I gotta, so I gotta fix that. I gotta, I gotta get a new printer. But then I plan to start on inkjet printing at home with pigment inks on fine art papers, probably like photo rags, things like that. But I also have a friend that's pushing me uh, to experiment with C-type prints, light jet prints, uh, and face mounting on acrylic. So I expect that there's gonna be a whole experimentation phase where I'm trying different kinds of printing uh, on different mediums and then different types of presentation, like mounting on acrylic versus standard traditional framing. Uh, so stay tuned on that. I think it'll be a while. It's expensive to print. I attribute it to being an R&D cost, a cost of doing business. So depending on what the potential commercial viability is, uh, that may see the light of day in one form or another. So we'll see. From Millinting, Millinting, <laughs> oh, man, I'm bad at this. Will you be shooting in California sometime? Almost guaranteed. Uh, 
there's just so much there to photograph. Uh, the Redwoods, Death Valley, White Mountains, Yosemite, uh, Joshua Tree, the coast. I mean, you, you name it. There's just so much there. And it's relatively close to me. I mean, it, it does take a day day's drive for me to get from Utah to California, depending on where I'm going. But there's just so much there. There's so much I haven't seen yet. And there's places I've been in the past that I want to return to with a large format camera. So almost, almost guaranteed. Yeah. J Robes 27. Do you have a favorite photograph that you've ever taken? Uh, that's probably the subway in Zion National Park. It's kind of a tough call, but I think that's the one. Uh, just because I remember the first trip down there. It was such a bucket list location. I was determined to get down there that fall. And it's if you've never been there, uh, there's a permit system in place that you have to enter a lottery to get a permit, wilderness permit, to be able to hike down in there. And the whole experience of going through that, getting my permit, hiking all the way down there with a the camera, setting up. I got there so early in the morning. I had so much time. I shot, I mean, there's more than just the subway in the area. You can shoot a lot of stuff on the way. The subway was the pinnacle of that whole trip. That, that's, that's where the hike ends, unless you're going to rappel down a different direction or something. But if you're doing a bottom-up hike, that's, that's the end of the hike. And the first time I saw it, not only was it a feeling of accomplishment, but it's just awe-inspiring to see. It's such a beautiful location. Uh, it's such a cool feature. And then add to that, I had the whole location to myself because I got there so early. And I kept thinking that at any moment, there's going to be a whole crowd of photographers coming down here that are going to come set up in the same location. But no, I, I had the whole place to myself. And I shot, I don't know how many photographs, uh, but I managed to get it while the glow was present. I framed it so carefully. I put so much into that photograph. Uh, and I did a video on it too. I'll link to that up here. But I was really proud of checking that one off. That was an icon for me. Uh, but I was really happy with the shot that I got. And I think I did really well. I've returned since then, of course, in years recent uh, of dead trees falling. There's a fallen log that's fallen in the composition now. Uh, I think I like my shot without it better. Although I'm sure you could be creative with that log and, and make it work too. But it's just a whole combination of, you know, the story leading up to taking that. It's a, it's a shot that so many people already have. Uh, I've never shot it on film. I may someday, I don't know, but I'm really happy with my digital shot. It was also one of the earliest cases I had of feeling really, truly successful. You know, I was really happy with the photo. I thought the print turned out great. It looks great on my wall. Uh, and hopefully someday um, in the near future, I'll be able to print it again, even better in, as part of a collection. We'll see. And then the last one's from Marshall Evans Photo. Dream location, lens, and camera. Photography, solo, or with friends? See, that Marshall's a clever guy. <laughs> he knows that. We've talked about this in person uh, a couple times, briefly. Uh, and he's been trying to get me to talk about this for a while, so here we go. Uh, dream location, Antarctica, for sure. For a number of reasons, but it's just so remote. It's so far down there. You see so little work come from there. But the body of work that comes out of there is just... I don't know. I don't know what it is about the landscapes that are just so remote and hostile. Uh, but there's something about it that's just intriguing to me. And more than just even a photo location, which the stuff I've seen is beautiful. Just beautiful. Uh, Adam Gibbs has got a zine from Antarctica, and I absolutely love that work that he's done. Um, but more than the photographs, uh, it's the adventure and the experience of going that really adds to it. So the photographs you capture, yeah, it's fantastic if you can get good photos and create a compelling body of work while you're there but if you can do that while having an experience of a lifetime and just experiencing an absolutely incredible landscape like that uh adds a whole level of meaning to those photos as far as lens and camera uh probably an arca swiss f-line four by five monorail uh but of course anything arca swiss is just incredibly expensive uh but I'd love the idea of going back to a monorail sometime. Uh, and I think something along those lines would be really nice someday. If I ever have a chunk of money lying around, I don't know what to do with. In photography, solo or with friends? Uh, that, I think that depends on who you are uh, and what your drive and motive is about. 
to be honest. I think it's fair to say that probably everything uh, is more fun when you have a friend or friends to share with. But the trick is to find a buddy that supports you and shares your passion. If you're focused on the same things and you're there for the same purpose, you will see different things uh, and you can learn from each other uh, in that regard. The thing is, it can be hard for some to find friends that fit those descriptions. People who want to stand there in the same location for hours, you know, waiting to take one photograph or waiting for the best version of a photograph. Uh, so if they're not there for the same reasons uh, and have the same purpose there as you do, uh, that can become a distraction. So uh, the vast majority of my work has been done solo. I've been a lone wolf kind of my whole life. Uh, so working solo doesn't bother me at all. But as I make more friends uh, that are photographers, um, this starts to change. You know, as you start to network, um, become part of a community of people. Some people have a strong enough vision and motive uh, to create their work completely, entirely isolated by themselves. Uh, some people just work better that way. Others can benefit from more of a sense of community where they can grow as individuals, uh, but then also learn from others and from the experience. Uh, so I think it depends on who you are. Uh, both can be valid, depending on the person. And in that regard, uh, if you're one of those types that works well within a community of people, I highly encourage you to find you know, photographer friends that you can hang out with and learn from. It's, it's a lot of fun. So that's all the questions you guys asked me. I hope that was entertaining, at least. Uh, and now, let's talk about my favorite photographs of the year. This can be a somewhat difficult task, but I chose 12 photographs. 12 just because I think it's a nice even number. There's 12 months in the year is 12 photographs. The criteria was that these had to be images that were featured in videos I released this year. Some of the earlier photographs were actually taken in Zion last year during the fall season, but their videos didn't come out until this year. So they weren't picked in last year's video because I hadn't released that video. So those photographs came forward to this year and were candidates for my favorites this year. From there, I had about 80 plus photographs. <laughs> and I down selected from there, choosing only the ones I thought were the best out of that set. And then I took the best out of that set and finally got it down to 12 images. So those are the images that I'm going to feature. And then I took those 12 images and asked my Patreon patrons to vote on which photograph was the number one photo for 2022. For what it's worth, I'm glad you guys decided because I don't think that I could have. <laughs> so put the burden on you guys. But thank you to my Patreon patrons for your support. It's greatly appreciated. Uh, and all of your contributions just go towards helping me make more videos and content like this. So thank you so much. So without further delay, here's that image along with the rest of my picks for 2022, along with some of my thoughts as I've reflected on each image. Hope you enjoy. First order of business is the photo that my Patreon patrons voted as the best image of 2022. This image comes from a particularly frigid day in the Narrows during a winter visit to Zion National Park. This pocket in the sandstone walls full of colorful stones took on a purplish blue hue, which balances perfectly with the strong reflected light and the highlights of this composition. And while all of these photos are my favorites, I was certainly happy to see that this one ranked at the top. This next one is from my summer trip in Mount Rainier National Park. A week worth of being rained out meant that we never got a chance to see the mountain as it never once came out of the clouds. But I was still plenty happy with all the mood and atmosphere in the park, and one particularly rainy day left me with the perfect opportunity to get this shot of Christine Falls. Next up is an image from the ancient bristlecone pines. I stumbled upon this tree with the wood grain exposed, and I found the combination of light and dark streaks interesting. I don't actually have any idea how old this particular tree was, but it could very easily be thousands of years. And as if all the massive amounts of detail in this photo weren't enough, the thought of that just makes me enjoy the photo even more. This next image is also from the Bristlecone Pines. This one was an unexpected shot, as a bird flew into the composition as I was talking to the camera. I was amazed that he stayed perfectly still as I frantically fired off another shot. And although it's small in the composition, I kind of like the fact that it doesn't draw a lot of attention. 
and it rewards the viewer for looking closer. This next photograph is from my trip to Norway, the Lofoten Islands, in February. This tiny village of red cabins lining the fjord is an iconic location, and it certainly didn't disappoint while we were there. I really like the subtle highlights from the low sun, which gave shape to the snow and the massive slab of rock that you can just make out underneath the water surface. This one's from the San Juan Mountains of Colorado, and this oddly colored creek is loaded with iron deposits which turn the rocks a rust color. Tragically, the water is toxic, having been contaminated by drainage from nearby century-old abandoned mines. This gives the photo an element of conflict. Though I still find the photo striking and beautiful, therein also lies something more sinister. This is a second image from the Narrows during my winter visit to Zion National Park. The aquamarine tones in the water and the orangish sandstone of the walls are opposites on the color wheel, which gives this scene a striking color contrast. This corner of the canyon I've tried to photograph a number of times, and I think this version on Ektar is my favorite so far. This scene with a stack of boulders and orange maple leaves filling in the cracks, and just the slightest tint of blue in the neutral white tones as the sky reflects off the rocks, again provides some color contrast to an already very graphic looking scene full of shapes and detail. In this image from Zion this last fall, where rainstorms the night before had left the slick rock damp, and as it evaporated, parts of the slick rock that had striations stood out even more against the lighter dry sections of rock. The combination of strong horizontal lines with the diagonal fractures of the slick rock made for an interesting subject. And one more from the Lofoten Islands in Norway. On a third visit to this location, there were dramatic clouds and atmosphere in the sky. And as the tide receded, I found a section of rock in the foreground that was channeling the incoming waves, forming an almost spiral shape. The subtle warm glow from the early morning sun hitting the high clouds stands out nicely against the blues of this nearly monochromatic image. In this leaf litter shot from Zion National Park, featuring a prominent and centrally located orange maple leaf. I enjoy the variety of warm tones and all of the various leaves, and the way the central leaf adds order to the disorder and chaos of the upside down leaves around it. And my final pick from a snowy and blustery Bryce Canyon in the spring. The blowing snow simplified the background and allowed me to focus on these hoodoos without all the chaos of the canyon rim behind it. So that's it for now. I hope you enjoyed this video. And if you did, you can let me know by hitting that thumbs up button down below. And if you want to make sure you're up to date on what I'm up to next, uh, make sure you're subscribed if you're not already. Thanks for watching. Happy New Year. Take care of yourselves. And I'll catch you in the next video.